Hello, Manchester, Auburn, Hooksett. This is the Progress Report for this uh, uh, Wednesday, September 20th. Folks, we're more than half Perfect. Through sort of the magical month of September, which is the month of hurricanes and now apparently an earthquake. But it also is just a magical month in New England and especially in New Hampshire when you see the first foliage come out, the days are still warm, the nights are cool and crisp. This month should be much longer than it is, which is 30 days, and we're two-thirds of the way through it. But we're on the progress report because it's Wednesday. It's great to be here on the progress report on a Wednesday, Bob. And your slogan <laughs> is, it's the most dangerous hour on TV, and we like to keep it that way if we can. And we got a lot to talk about. We had the city elections yesterday. I think there were some surprising results that we want to talk about. We have other issues we want to talk about. And we're very glad to uh, welcome to our set uh, uh, Ward 12 uh, School Committee man, Connie Van Houten, who uh, did top the ticket in Ward 12 again, but it was pretty close. And uh, she's a uh, passionate supporter of public education in Manchester and has done an awful lot. Uh, you know, they used to say, if you can't do things, you teach. And I always thought that was the most pejorative thing you can say because I don't know anybody that does more than our public school teachers. Um, I think teaching is doing something too. It certainly is. It's changing lives. And a lot in the all, balance. We can all think back. Uh, practically everybody I think can think back. There's a teacher in my life who made a great difference. I certainly can. I bet you can, Mike. I don't have to think back too far. I bet you can, Connie, and I'm <laughs> sure you've made yeah. that kind of difference in lots of people's lives. But one of the things we have been doing on the Progress Report since January 20th of this year is dealing with the Trump administration by what uh, Mike, my good friend, says is the POTUS report or the Progress Report. Well, and thanks. Ready again. I'm ready again. And for this week's POTUS report on the Progress Report, I'm going to bring a little story that uh, dropped yesterday at about 4.30 p.m. It hasn't gotten a heck of a lot of airplay, um, but it's popping up here and there. Um, it has to do with um, President Trump's legal bills. And uh, Reuters is reporting that President Trump is using money donated to his reelection campaign, which he started the day after the inauguration, um, and also uh, Republican National Committee money to pay for his lawyers in the probe of alleged Russian interference into our election uh, last election season. Um, CNN has uh, confirmed that, and they're reporting that the Republican National Committee paid in August more than $230,000 to cover some of Trump's legal fees uh, related specifically to this um, Russia uh, uh, vote tampering probe. Uh, Trump's lead lawyer, John Dowd, got $100,000 from the RNC, and uh, they also paid $131,000 to the Constitutional Litigation and Advocacy, Advocacy Group, and that's the firm where Jay Sekulow um, is a partner, and you may remember him. He's the guy that goes on the Sunday morning talk shows, and he's very, very bombastic. He's a, a real ideologue. So he picked up $131,000 from the Republican National Committee. Um, it is important to note that the Federal Election Commission allows the use of private campaign funds to pay legal fees, but the intent of that law has always been to pay the kind of legal fees that are associated with a campaign, such as um, legal fees dealing with state-by-state -state compliance with election laws, um, routine legal matters such as ballot access disputes and that type of thing. Um, President Trump um, is the first president in, under the modern campaign finance system to be using uh, campaign funds to cover uh, his response to a criminal probe. This is a, this is a first, according to legal experts. So um, in, in addition to, to uh, paying his own, um, he also um, is, uh, it, it, I, I want to get the number here so I get it right, um, $50,000 was paid uh, to the law firm representing his son, Donald Trump Jr. Um, apparently, his, his legal uh, fees are up in, in the millions at this point, um, and so I, I guess you could say that this, um, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, may not uh, be uh, 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 more than a drop in the bucket. But the fact is that people who are donating to his campaign and people who are donating to um, the RNC, perhaps to get a senator elected in their state, that money is is being used to pay lawyers to defend Donald Trump, uh, and it's a first. It's the first time a, 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 a campaign has used funds to pay it for a criminal defense. And as I was saying earlier, it appears there's no bar too low that the Trumps can't crawl under it. You know, you know, Mike. This just makes me think. 
the disgrace in this country is not that things are done that are illegal. It's the things that are done that shouldn't be done, which are legal. I yeah, mean, just because you can doesn't I mean, mean you that's, should. That, that is, is, it's disgraceful. You know, you know, several years ago, we had a Speaker of the House who's still a very prominent Republican. He's the Majority Leader, uh, Gene Chandler from Bartlett. And he, oh, used to, yes. he used to have this thing at it, his home up in Bartlett called the, the Corn Husker. I think it was in the fall, you know. And it was a big barbecue, big, big cookout. It was a big barbecue. Well attended. And, and, and well attended, raised lots of money. Well and attended he, by people and who he was were using, in government, too. And he was using it to pay the daily expenses of maintaining himself, like paying his mortgage. That was legal. I mean, uh, and you know, we have many people that have vast well, he, campaign he, he accounts. He paid a price for it, though. I mean, he's he come back, but he paid for a political it. price but for it. But he's the majority leader again. He's come back. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the things that are legal but wrong that we allow in this country. Well, Bob, who writes the laws? It's these guys that write the laws. Yeah. Why do you think they make these things legal? Yeah. But I, I do think the intent, I mean, it, it would be kind of ridiculous to say that a campaign, you couldn't use campaign funds to pay for the ordinary legal expenses of, of running a campaign. Yeah. That, so it makes sense that, that they would be legal to do that. It's just stepping over that previous line that you don't use it for your own personal defense. So everybody should keep in mind, when you see people saying, you know, whether it's an event, whether it's a Martin Luther King dinner, whether it's, you know... A, Democratic state convention, any a Republican convention, when you see all these ads, you know, sponsored by a representative or senator so and so, was that really him or hers money, or was that coming out of their campaign account? I think most of the time it was out of their campaign accounts, and I've been guilty which, of it too, which is legal. at that's, a very that's a legal modest level, you know. Funds. You know, you want to support the, uh, you know, the uh, St. Patrick's Day breakfast at the, you know, which you do so well, Mike. You know, sure I do because I, I have it in my campaign account. <laughs> I'm just saying, folks, this is the way it is. And when you think people are writing checks out of their own personal checking accounts to support these things, not very often. That's my guess. Well, anyway. well that's the POTUS report. And, again, a new, a new line has been crossed. A new era has been entered. Yeah. And here we are. Here we are. So I want to thank Connie Van Houten for joining us because she had a long day yesterday. You know, the polls were open for 13 hours, and you were probably there for all 13. Or... I was on my feet the whole time. And that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a day that goes by real slowly. It is. <laughs> real <laughs> slowly. I say when there's a low turnout, which it was yesterday. It yeah. goes slower in November than September, though. At least you oh, had yeah. daylight. <laughs> yeah, daylight. So that's going to come you, up. you know, Bob, I did note, um, you know, Ted, Ted Gatsis um, had fewer votes over the city than, um, than did Joyce Craig. But he won two wards. I know. Your ward, You're my right. ward. <laughs> so I think we've got to step up our game, my friend. Yeah. We have a caller. Let's awesome. get to our caller because we like our callers. Hello, Roland. Join us on the progress report, please. Oh, turn down your TV, Roland. Hey. We're, on, we're on a delay, and it'll confuse the heck out of you. We want to talk with you, oh, Roland. I think Go we right lost ahead. him. I think we lost him. Okay. Oh, there he is. Um, you're talking about... Uh Trump about you know, spending that that money, which is legally, which he actually shouldn't be doing. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's it's like that's what I'm saying. I want it to be fair. It is, it is not an illegal campaign expenditure. It's just a new new use of campaign money that hasn't been okay. seen before. That happens. Maybe a politician that doesn't have uh, some some blotch on their record. Maybe a oh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, well, that's that's the condition. Anyone? Go ahead. What about uh, Clinton? It's legal. She to get money from uh, Saudi Arabia and all those Midwestern country, uh, countries. Well, now uh, wait a minute. Mid-Eastern, rather. And um, Roland, that's happens, one of that's one of the few talk rules. Talk about women's rights. You ever see how they treat women in uh, mid mid eastern countries? Yeah. It's terrible. Okay, so this is the. You, I know you are, but what am I? Okay, I understand. But mm -hmm. you know, Roland, there are other people who are also bad. Does that exonerate right, Trump? The point I'm trying to get at is Trump may be. You know, he's not perfect, but name me a person that is. I agree. No one, nobody's okay. perfect. No, but there's, there's degrees of imperfection, and we've reached the maximum degree of imperfection with Trump. Uh, by the way, one of the few rules we have is that foreign contributions to American political campaigns are illegal. So. Oh, so in other words, uh, she's been getting illegal uh, 
if she if she got if she got contributions money came from if she got contributions that were not from American citizens those were illegal and I don't know that that happened I hear you saying it but I don't believe it actually happened because that is one of the few rules that's very firm and very and very uh, not ambiguous at all you cannot take political contributions from foreigners well I guess Clinton's in trouble then. But anyway, uh, I just want to tell you, um, I disagree with you, but I just want to let you know that I respect your viewpoint. Well, and we respect well, thank yours, you. and, and we thank appreciate you for your calling in. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, that's uh, that's a good start, I guess. Um, thank you for calling, Roland. Connie, talk to us about how you feel about the elections yesterday, and we we to talk about some school issues because you have a long career as a strong advocate for public education. I do. That's. That's my passion. That's my vocation. It's my avocation. Um, yesterday is, um, first of all, Word 12 is an extraordinary word. I know that we did not come out as strongly for Joyce as the other words did, but there's a great camaraderie there. Uh, we know these elections are nonpartisan. However, we know who's who. And really, everybody gets along really well. I'm always, I always feel a little more empowered that regardless of who wins there, there's somebody that's worked hard that's trying very hard, that has, a, I hope, an agenda or a philosophy to bring to the plate. And, and we really do get along. It's, it's a long time standing. It's a long time holding signs. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and people come in and out. You came in to help me out or help out the group, actually. Yeah. And it's really kind of good when that kind of thing happens. Now, when the tally came down, I was the top vote getter for school board, and I am the incumbent. Uh, but I did have a tough race. I had uh, two really good qualified candidates going against me. I don't I can't speak to their qualifications, but I know that they seem to be fine people, and that to me is, is an important thing. I won by, I didn't win, we don't have a winner or a loser in the primary per se. We just get to the finals. Yeah, I topped, uh, I topped the, the, next, um, the next vote getter down by 31 votes, which sounds okay, except that in any primary there's another candidate who's factored out. And those, those votes that came with that candidate will now go theoretically someplace else. Realizing, of course, that the scope of voters, I hope, gets larger in the general election. Hopefully more people will come out than, than for the primary. That usually is the case. Yeah. So um, I, I, I'm respectful of the process. I'm respectful that I have competition, and I believe in competition, by the way. I, I, I think we all should be opposed. I think that makes us stronger, and it makes us come out for who we are. But I'll be working hard. Um, I, I believe very much that I can bring something to the plate for the school board. One of the biggest things still on my agenda, and actually there are several things, but the redistricting. That still has not happened, and I think it's reprehensible it that it to. has not. It has to. I was at um, our school, Northwest, I think three or four days before school started. I went up to do some professional development with the teachers. I, I really feel that if I stay networked with our schools, I have a better view of what's going on. And at that time, we had five kindergarten classes. 24 is the cap for a kindergarten class, and I don't buy that for a minute. Imagine having 24 children at your daughter's or son's birthday party in your home at age yeah, four or five. That's a good way to put it. Um, but wow. nonetheless, our cap was 24, and we were a total of five over the cap. The next day, I went back, and we were 15 over the cap. Now, of course, I did my due diligence. I fired off an email to um, Superintendent Vargas, and I followed up with a phone call. Uh, and ultimately, we now have a sixth class put in. But that just highlights how quickly we are growing in a school that's already mm -hmm. pretty full. Yeah, Northwest. Oh, that's, that school was full the day it opened its doors. It I mean, topped that, 700, yeah, and that beats. Oh, uh, no kidding! It's over 700 now. Parkside's under 700. Holy cow. It kind my, of my grandkids and my yeah. kids both went to the, to to that to Northwest, yeah. so that's. And I don't I mean to diminish the school. It. It's I, a great I, school. They do great things. They do things, so much in there. That, but how uh, long do we burden something and make it great before it starts to, sh to shred? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's like putting a weight on something. It works really well now, but eventually, if it's an inappropriate weight, you're going to weaken the whole structure. So, no, I, I believe in the school wholeheartedly. Um, Shelley Larishell, who won Principal of the Year yes, uh, the did. year before this, um, is, is masterful. Uh, and, and it's not just her. The, the Mr. McDonald is also. Oh, uh, yeah. They, it's an incredible school. As I said, I did the professional development with them uh, for the first official uh, school day for teachers. And I'm just, I always, I walk out of there feeling their energy, feeling their spirit, and knowing that they're going to take good care of our kids. But I also walk out of there thinking, Connie, if you're on the school board for whatever length of time, shame on you if you don't get this redistricting taken care of. Well, so what is the average class size at Northwest right now, do you know? Um, I don't know the actual numbers right now. I know that kindergarten and grade one are 
pretty close. They're pretty tight. And uh, grade four was looking a little bit heavy. Now, I haven't checked in. Our check-in point is October 1st. We use that as a date for the, for the state um, for our adequacy funds. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we're pretty sure that we have a st fairly stable population. We've accounted for youngsters that haven't shown up, and maybe they've moved and they haven't withdrawn from the school. So we are, we're looking pretty close. And as I said, our numbers are 702, I believe, right now. That's a lot of kids. We have two grade sure two is. classrooms and one of the portables. I think I've been um, pretty adamant, um, both publicly and privately, that those portables are something I do not want to see in use. They've been there a long time. They have. Yeah. And, and there's something neat about having, you know, an air-conditioned area. But I've pulled up to the school when a teacher has been between the building and the portables in a mist, a fog, you know, escorting a kid across. It, it's just wrong. And it's wrong to segregate those classes. Now, we're only using one for Northwest. The other one is, it's a fantastic program. It was a fight to the finish to get the program, I must say. But, um, and of course, I, I was in support. But Southern New Hampshire Services has um, uh, partnered with a couple of other, other groups, and they are running a basic Head Start program in one of the portables. And we are providing the in-kind services, the portable building. But they're providing the teachers, the staff. Um, they're providing the materials. 22, 20 to 22 of our west side, our, our kids on the west side who are needy, who need that head start, uh, are going to get services because they have stepped up and offered this to our district. So one of the portables is, is in use for that, and the other has two grade two classes. Never, and I, I'm okay with the, the, um, this new pro, with the um, Southern New Hampshire Services program, and only because they've chosen to upgrade the, com, you know, the, the facility. But I want every kid to be in the building who's enrolled in our schools. Yeah. I no, think I think so. um, the parents pay their taxes just like everybody else. They, they, they deserve do. to be treated like any other student. And to be fair, we are taking steps. Um, we did have a committee for probably a year and a half, um, and I was always a little concerned about the committee because they were school board members. And I was not on the committee, but were I there? What do I know about facilities? What do I know about you know, what, what the maximum for a classroom would, would be? I'm a teacher at heart and kind of retired or semi-retired now but to me a classroom that looks as though it could fit 30 may only fit six youngsters who have special needs i can't imagine trying to teach 30 kids well you know bob i i i come from a time and and, and there's a I, I speak with people who have a similar background with me but i went to a parochial school and we would have 35 kids lined up in desks that were bolted to the floor with chairs that were bolted to the floor and one teacher no teacher's aid no nothing no n no could, other teacher they could do their education room. in that circumstances probably absolutely took a, probably took a ruler i'm not i'm not going to say that that didn't loom over your head as a possibility but i'm not going to say that there was anything wrong with it i, I think i got a darn good education from the parochial really? schools absolutely really? and 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 I, I do not in the classroom. I, I'm, I'm here to tell you I was in I was there I experienced it well, I'm glad and it was quiet and orderly and we wore neckties and uh, mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean and that's the way it was now you can't do that in a public school system well, I fully fully recommend that uh, oh, recognize because yep. you can't yep. make them wear ties well I mean I mean it's just it's a different situation yeah. you have yeah. to take all comers including special needs yeah. and back when I was in yeah. school special needs was not treated the same it wasn't mainstream so it's yeah, a whole different universe different. I, I, I want to make sure that I'm clear on that I you understand are. the concept that that 30 kids in a cl modern classroom might not work but I'm here to tell you there are way if, if, if there's a will there's a way you know and and, and I'm here to tell you that it worked and back at Memorial, earlier on in my career, I had 30, 35, oh, We had 36. big classes when yeah. I was in Memorial. I, there was a broom closet that was converted into a classroom for me. And I was short one desk, and we always hoped one student would be absent. Otherwise, I mean, and my desk was utilized already. Wow. So it was just, it was that, the heyday of things. Oh, God, there was I a cycle yeah, of Yeah, the, we were jammed. God, I love you were, people yeah. that can do this. I mean, there, it's just yeah. awesome. It's cyclical. The, we have the more students and less students. The commitment our teachers have to their students. Absolutely. I applaud every one of them. And This director of yours is telling us we've got to take I a I think break. it's time for a break. We can regroup, maybe uh, come up with some new topics to talk about. Well, we're going we're gonna, to uh, talk a little bit more about the elections. Oh, sure. I want to talk about some other issues, too. And, interesting uh, quote in the newspaper we might Interesting quote in the newspaper. I did promise I would talk about my adventures at the Seabrook Nuke yesterday. <laughs> we'll see if we get to that. Folks, we'll be right back uh, with, an, with the next segment of the Progress Report with our guest tonight, Connie Van Houten.
Hello, everybody. We're back. This is the Progress Report for this Wednesday, uh, September 20th. The waning days of the summer. It's yeah, it's getting dark enough. early now, isn't it? Huh? And yeah. it's not even daylight, still daylight saving time. And we are here with uh, a guest we're very glad to have with us, Connie Van Houten, school committeeman from uh, Ward 12, also a state rep from uh, the Floterial District, which is Wards 10, 11, and 12. And a person so that's a tough district to win as state rep too. That's good. Well, thank you. <laughs> good job on that. Thanks. That's and, a uh, lot of walking. Yes. Connie's been denounced by many, but keeps winning. And she <laughs> did win the primary this time. But there's a final coming up right now. We've been talking about issues at uh, Manchester Education, particularly about redistricting and uh, the uh, extreme number of students that they have at Northwest Elementary, where they have had and continue to use for many years now these so-called portable classrooms that are detached from the main school building and that's that's kind of an issue but you know our people are doing a fantastic job here in the manchester school district connie's uh, done a program here for a long time you still doing it i do well, which you're talking about here, you know the uh, that the, 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 you know the perception of Manchester schools is way far short of the reality, which is weird. Developing developing a lot of good quality opportunities for our kids, our 15,000 kids in the Manchester school district. But I thought we just might talk a little bit more about the um, the elections. Um, the, the big news, of course, was that last uh, well Tuesday yesterday we had um, we had Joyce Craig uh, get a substantial vote margin over our incumbent mayor for seeking his fourth term, I believe, Ted Gatzis. Uh, Joyce is running for uh, mayor for the second time. And I was very, very struck by when I picked up today's union leader and saw this quote from Ted Gatzis. I'd like our our guest to talk about, you know, Mike and our guest to talk about. Yeah, I don't his, understand it. I can't say much. His, here's, his, here's his quote after losing to Joyce yesterday by 800 votes and in losing in all wards except Mike's Ward 8 and our nice. Ward 12 uh, laments there. And we will change that. We will change <laughs> that. We're going to work on it. He, here's the quote. I look at tonight with great optimism given that I have outperformed my primary performance two years ago, said Gatz in a statement. I look forward to the next 40 year plus hard candy, blah, blah, blah. He's claiming he did better last night than two years ago. And my recollection is that his opponent last two, year, two years ago was none other than all, then Ward Alderman won Joyce Craig. This is true. So, uh, and I think he makes sense he out of He came out ahead of her. I mean, in the is, this, is, this, is this just. He did? He did two I years ago? I believe that he did, in yes. In the primary, I, I think. I believe I recall that, yes. Oh well, then, then why is he taking why is he but taking that's, that's, comfort in last night's results? Well, this is a mathematical enigma. I'm sure. Yes, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's I'm not a, much it's, of a math guy, but I don't understand this. It can't be percentages; it has to be raw numbers. And I'm and we we speculated. I don't recall if there was a, a strong third candidate yeah. who might have siphoned off some Democratic votes, or and 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 re, with the result that Mayor Gatzis had a higher percentage. I don't know. I it's it's hard to understand because the the, the votes of the other two in the race were, were you know minuscule. Yeah, hundred and Glenn a hundred and the votes. other guy. Yeah. Uh, they, no. were not, they were not single. So I, I may write this and I went, what? Just correct me if I'm wrong. Did Pat Arnold run in that race? Was that Pat Arnold as well? Is that the third person? That might have been. Might have been. That might have been. Might have and been. that certainly I, uh, would have yeah. split. Right. I, I think you're right because that would have that been Pat be Arnold's that second be run for mayor. Yeah. And and as as I'm thinking back, I think that's true because that's there true. was uh, there was they, right. you know they were vying for democratic support, right. and uh, and and of course he would definitely have diminished Joyce Craig's uh, voter turnout in in a three way yeah. primary. Well, then then at best he's trying to make a hearty stew out of pretty thin gruel, claiming he did better than last night than he did two years ago because last yeah, time. But even that, I would have thought that you know, against two Democrats, his number would still have been bigger two years ago. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Hard, hard so, to understand. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Anybody want to weigh in on that? We'd welcome you. Six four zero three zero nine one. But you know, Ward Twelve was an interesting place last night. Not only for the race you were in, but uh, I think our race for Alderman was pretty stunning. We had a. Uh, and I'd like you to talk about this. We have. A, we had a uh, primary contest between our incumbent Alderman Keith Hirschman, and we had uh, Joel Elber, who's my colleague from Ward 12 serving in the state legislature for the, you know, his first term. 
And then we had a young, young guy, I mean, a really young guy named Hassan Essa, who uh, came to this country as a refugee, is still a student. I guess he's in the National Guard and worked his tail off and won a position for the finals. Astronomical, and he's a fine young man. I don't he's know him very well. I've met him on the campaign trail, but uh, it's an certainly exciting story. He worked pretty hard, and he certainly got some wind, wind in his sails. Yeah. Um, and it's a tribute, I think, to the young Democrats as well. Yeah. Uh, those those younger people that are stepping up, one, to support each other, but two, to, to take their places in society and to help to empower us. I don't think we should throw the, the old people out, obviously. <laughs> uh, that historical perspective is important, but I think to start to bring the young people in and, and to, to bring them to the table is astronomical. But I... I was very pleased to see, and, and a Joel, Joel worked very hard, too. I don't mean to diminish anybody. Everybody Joel worked does hard. work hard. He does. Uh, it was just kind of a, a dif different story to have a, a young man of this background emerge. Yeah, kind of exciting. It's just yeah. very, very exciting, and he's a charming and delightful and talented young guy, and I've, I've enjoyed getting to, to know him, and, you know, I, I wish him well. It's not going to be easy in the finals, but uh, if I was Keith, I'd be a little worried about uh, this guy coming out of nowhere and... Uh, to me, that was a huge upset. And just to huge uh, upset. Just to, I, as you know, perhaps um, we tried to get contact with uh, with Hassan to see if he could come in tonight for the show, and he's actually in a class. He's taking courses at UNH Manchester, and I believe his major is biology yeah. oh, or some good. science area. But he's in a class tonight. No kidding. So this is a young man with um, a lot of energy. The man on the make. He's on the yeah. move. And we will, Keep your eye on that guy. Huh? We will definitely have him on this show yeah. when he doesn't have class obligations because it's a. Uh, it's been a he's a charming fellow and a hard worker and represents a lot of what's great about America, you know, a refugee coming here. Mm -hmm. And I, I told him, I said, you know, I had a couple of meetings, I said, uh, Hassan, don't be disappointed if you don't win. I mean, this is your first outing. There's always a, I, you know, it took me quite a while to get elected anything. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, I think I've got a good chance. I said, well, you know. Nice for you to be, uh, you know, optimistic, but Jesus, he pulled Well, now out. you can give him some full-throated support. I can, <laughs> I can give him full-throated support, which I'm going to be very, very happy to do. You know, we had an interesting race over in Ward 8, too. Uh, we yes. had a contested uh, aldermanic race and also a special election for state rep uh, to replace uh, the departed Steve Valancourt. Uh, so the turnout was pretty good. Um, that state rep race had a contest on the Republican side. So um, I, I was holding a sign at the polls later in the day and uh, talking to some folks, and um, they nearly ran out of Republican ballots uh, to the point where they actually requested an, an additional batch. I don't know if they ever were shipped really? in. But, uh, they, so um, it, my understanding is that more Republicans turned out uh, in Ward 8, which may explain why uh, Ted Gatsis um, took more votes than Joyce. He's got a pretty, pretty Republican. I mean, it's a very Republican ward. It's a, it's a, it's a, a very Republican ward. Um, and it's got a strong, uh, solid uh, Democratic population that turns out to vote. Um, but uh, I think Betsy De DeVries, uh, who came through um, uh, the primary, um, did a really strong job because she topped the ticket despite the fact that I think the voter turnout was leaned decidedly Republican uh, in this particular primary. Um, so I think that bodes well for her. Um, she uh, got about 39 percent of the vote. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, th I think she looks pretty strong. And if you take her vote uh, combined with the, the votes that Eddie Sapienza got, she nearly doubles um, the GOP candidate, who is a, a young man uh, out for his first uh, uh, run in politics, from yeah. what I understand. So I think it bodes well for Eddie. I, I'm sorry, for uh, Betsy. Um, I think Eddie worked very, very hard. He knocked on a lot of doors. He had a lot of signs out in the neighborhood. It's his second run. I think uh, his, right. his name's getting out there. Um, yeah, he, he posted got, he, good numbers. He, he well, he got under under 300 votes. I, uh, I just yeah, I, just I, under I, I, about 20 23 percent. I I would have thought he would have done a little bit better for the effort that he put in. But he was running against a very well known quantity. Betsy DeVries Betsy has DeVries been, a, been an a, alderman. A state uh, she's been a state senator and a state rep from Ward Eight, and has been around for many, 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 many years. Yeah. So um, it was a very still interesting. Still, maybe the only woman to be a firefighter in the city of Manchester. At least the first one. At least we the know first one. we know she was at least the first. One. And uh, so I, I, I wish Betsy all the best. I think she did very well. Um, I think uh, going home, I thought maybe the Republican uh, aldermanic candidate might top the ticket just because of what we were seeing for turnout. But so I, I think that bodes well for Betsy. But um, I think it did affect the numbers for uh, Ted Gatzis. Sure.
tag all those Republicans with Trump. We have a call. <laughs> Let's take the call. Hey, John, welcome to the Progress Report for uh, for this Wednesday. We're glad to have you with us. Yeah, hi. I'm a big fan of your show. Uh, this may be out of your, uh, um, what your, your topic that you're on tonight, but I was curious about uh, Manchester Public Access um, having a $100 fee to do a show on Manchester Public Access. I'm a Comcast uh, um, subscriber, and I'm also a Manchester resident taxpayer, and I wanted to do a show on Manchester Public Access, but I was informed that it cost $100, and I didn't think that was, um, I don't know, fair, or if there's, do you have any thoughts of why, or if that's a normal practice, but, you know, I'd like to join the, uh, the shows there. <laughs> We'd love oh, to have you. I, I John, let me tell you, if you want to wait around a while, if you get to be a senior citizen, it drops to 50. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm 55. Does that drop to 50? Well, you're getting close. You're getting close. John, listen, uh, <laughs> I've, I've, I've been a producer for uh, for quite, quite a long time uh, on Manchester Public TV, back when it was the old, um, uh, what was it, uh, MCAM uh, over at the other studio. And, and they've always had... A producer fee um, that is not a fee to produce one show that basically allows you access to the facilities for a full year yeah and that includes um, you can get training um, it, 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 you have access to equipment uh, cameras editing equipment and all that they, kind of they thing. give so, you a director although we oh. thanks to Mike Farley's son we have our own director and yeah but they you get they, quite they, a lot for that they'll put the show on for you and everything and it's not just a, a, a one-shot thing a hundred bucks per show um, so I, I, I know that doesn't reduce the amount, but I hope it, it makes it a little bit more understandable. Well, I just, I just, if, could you explain a little more why some public access channels uh, don't charge hundred dollars? It's a normal practice for all public access. It isn't being public access being accessible to the public, like someone like myself who just wants to go on and do a and do some do some shows uh, on mixed public access and unable to because. Um, yeah, the principle of the idea. thing, or just because they don't have the hundred dollars? Yeah, to, I, I can't. I, for it. I can't go. I, I don't know what the practice is at other public access um, stations. Um, I know that there is a, a a nonprofit corporation that has been set up, and it's many prominent former mayors of Manchester are on the board of directors, and and they're responsible um, for, for the operation of the of, of this particular these three stations. Um, there is a professional staff. Uh, I, I, I couldn't address that, but if you go um, on the web, um, look up uh, MPTS Manchester. Uh, if, you, if you use a search engine for that, you can go on the web and there's contact information, and I'm sure that you could get in touch with folks that would be able to talk to you. And I also believe there may be a waiver if it's a hardship. Um, the idea is to provide public access. So I, I think if you yeah, check the yeah, web. That was, my, that was my understanding that it you know, being a public access show. I have I have about a, a dozen or so, um, if you were, more comedy-type uh, shows already produced and done. I just want to get well, them on we to uh, <laughs> Manchester Public Access is all throwing down $100 on it. Well, and, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I know that we, we pay our annual fee to get this show on the air, and I think we get a lot for it. They give us the studio for an hour oh, uh, I'm sure, 52 I'm sure, times I'm sure a week. I'm sure you know? it's well worth $100, but my question was, since it is a public access station, um, wouldn't that make it not accessible to the, uh, the public um, who who wouldn't be able to do that? I don't you're, know. You're uh, barking up I the really wrong tree. Show and I hope someday I'll be able to uh, put my shows on there. I think uh, Channel 23 needs a little bit of humor. You guys do a good well, job on it, but you're always doing you know, serious political well, issues. I, I, but, uh, I my, hope it... My show is so I just, I appreciate, I didn't get quite the information that I'm looking for. Uh, well, check the I web. appreciate you uh, take, taking my question, sir. Glad to help out. Good luck, and uh, oh, look I, forward to seeing your show on uh, on, on public uh, access TV. I hope he gets I, on. I hope you can make it work. I really do. You know, I thought maybe we'd turn to another subject now, which we, you're getting pretty close to another break, but I'd, I'd like to go back to another subject, which I didn't warn you about, Connie. So okay. here Oh, this is going to be fun, the most <laughs> okay, dangerous hour in go. TV. Here you we know, go. I, I, <laughs> leading up to the primary election, I was reading the union leader, you know, for, you know, the th several days, three, four days before the uh, primary was was posting uh, uh, questions to the candidates oh, and, and their answers. Yeah. 
And question number one was, should Manchester be a sanctuary city? And the answers to that question were, were just all over the map. Uh, a huge number of people said, no, Manchester should not be a sanctuary city. And I'm not sure people really understood what that question really meant. And I think we might talk about that. Do you out there know what it means when it's, I mean, this may be an unfortunate use of the English language to talk about this way. Do you know what it means when we say we do or do not want Manchester to be a sanctuary? Do you actually know what that means? Does it, Bob, does anybody know? I mean, I, I don't see that, that there's a statute establishing a definition of this. I think it's an attitude taken, and I think the, the term has been adopted by the Trump administration yeah. uh, as a cudgel. Right. Um, I think that's right. And, and to use the word sanctuary as a cudgel is uh, it's, it's Orwellian. Well, a lot, of, a lot of people said, no, I'm not in favor of sanctuary. We don't want to give harbor to criminals. That's what a lot of people said. But it's a well, little more subtle than that. But there are people that believe that entry into the country illegally is a, is, is a crime. There are people that believe that, yeah. and, and that would well, be a consistent statement. There are crimes, and there are crimes. There's, you know, over, overstaying your parking meter time, and then there's, you know, murdering people. And, uh, you know, we've, we've got a situation in this city right now and in this state where people are being deported that have been here for years and years, and families are being torn, torn apart. Does the fact that these people came without the proper documents and they've lived here for years, raised families, paid their taxes, had jobs, contributed to society, does that mean that they should suffer deportation? Let's talk about that. And, you know, folks, call in 640-3091. We'll lead off with that when we get to our next and final segment of the Progress Report for this Wednesday, September 20th. Thank you for our calls. We'll be right back. Well, as always happens, the program is flying by. We arrived at our final segment for this Wednesday, uh, September 20th. We're very pleased to have with us uh, our sitting uh, school committeeman from Ward 12, Connie Van Houten, also a state representative representing the so-called Floterio, which means she represents Ward 10, 11, and 12 in the state house and has for, this is your second term, right, Connie? This is my first term in the state house. Oh, is it? Second term in the school board. Seems right? like you've been there because you got a lot done. We, and that's in part because I don't stick to my committee. I am on Commerce, yeah. and I'm always running into education and testifying there. And as a matter of fact, tomorrow I'll be going up to um, to watch the, uh, the the work that's going on for SB 193, which is the voucher bill. Oh yeah, which is something I'm very concerned about. Oh, so I'm, I'm here, there, and everywhere. Let me talk about that for and a minute. And you were going somewhere else. I don't want to take you from your. No, but you're taking me in a place I'm happy to go. Okay. One of the things I did today, folks. This is the time ending friday when we can file requests for legislation at the office of legislative services today i filed a bill which will become a bill to restore to new hampshire the opportunity for our citizens to sue the government of new hampshire merely in their status as taxpayers this is something we had for a long time folks taxpayer standing not available in the federal system but in the state of New Hampshire, we delight and applaud ourselves for our access to citizen access to government, whether it's town meetings, our many elections. Or even the courts. Or even the courts. Should you be able to go to court because you've paid some taxes to the state of New Hampshire in some form because you think the state is expending those taxpayer funds in an unconstitutional manner or not? I always thought you could do that. 
And in fact, that was done many times over 150 years. It's called taxpayer standing. Recently, the state, of, the state Supreme Court ruled in a case, in an education case, you knew about well, Connie, Duncan versus, I guess, I don't know, state. Department of Education, right? Uh, he's now on the he's now an edu commissioner in the Department of Education. He filed a lawsuit saying the voucher program to divert public funds to private schools, whether sectarian or not, was unconstitutional because public funds should be used for public schools. He won a decision before the New Hampshire Superior Court, our trial court, and then the other side appealed. And the New Hampshire Supreme Court decreed he had no standing to sue because he was suing because his he said his taxes are being misused contrary to the New Hampshire Constitution. Was that a, a case of first impression on taxpayer standing? Is it, did it take this long to, to for anyone to actually assert that on appeal? I don't. Or had it been previously decided and reversed? It had previously been accepted means to getting to court. And I don't, uh, I, you know, I. You, you understand you, my question? I, I, you got a good question. I got a good memorandum I can send you on this. I don't, <laughs> I don't know right now. But in any event, once that happened, the general court, which is our legislature, passed a law saying we authorize taxpayer suits against the state of New Hampshire. And you know what happened next? The New Hampshire Supreme Court declared that statute unconstitutional and said nobody in New Hampshire can sue merely because they're a taxpayer and they think their tax dollars are being expended for an unconstitutional purpose. Now, this bothers me a lot, a lot. And I have filed today a request for a constitutional amendment uh, called a CACR to try and reverse that with strong bipartisan support. You know support, you know is upset on the other side? Well, it turns out it's about the Manchester Board of Mayor and Alderman. Right, okay. Connie? We have had a couple of contracts right. that the Board of Mayor and Alderman has voted on, even though the city solicitor said, you should not vote on these contracts, these public employee contracts, because you have a son or a daughter or a wife or a spouse that's going to be benefited by this contract. That happened, and, the, uh, and uh, people like our good friend Joe Kelly, who's coming in right behind us here, said, we don't agree with that. We want to sue to stop that. They should not have been allowed to vote on that. should have been disqualified under the city charter, and the court ruled no standing. You can't sue because you're a taxpayer, and your municipal taxpayer funds are being, in, our, in the opinion of the people who wanted to bring this forward, misused. Now, who can sue? The New Hampshire rule on standing, who has the power to get into court and make a claim is, you have to show that your, your claim is different from the general mass of the people. You have been affected in some individualized way before you can go to the courts and ask for relief. Sounds good. Except what if the injury is to everybody, the whole citizenry? Then nobody can sue. And uh, this is, uh, this is the... Uh, <laughs> well, I, this, I, I think it's kind of ironic mm -hmm. that... So this, this is why I am with we're strong Republican support, and I hope we get there. We want to overcome this and say, in New Hampshire where we value the, the opportunity of citizens to challenge their government, whether it's standing up at town meeting, speaking out at the Board of Alderman in the public, you know, the public session, uh, going to the school committee, you, you should be able, if you think the state or the city is spending your money in violation of what the Constitution requires, you should be able to challenge that in court. Now, will this lead to, lead to a lot of frivolous lawsuits? Possibly some, but they'll be quickly dismissed because the courts have tools to deal with frivolous lawsuits, like imposing costs on you if you're, you're wasting their time. So, how did I get on this? But that's, that's in any event, that's something that's coming right up. We want taxpayer standing back. And uh, principally, uh, how did in regard to this issue of vouchers to support private educational institutions with public money. How did it, how did it come about that something that had been done for over 150 years suddenly was un deemed unconstitutional. What what was the reasoning of the court? I just don't well, understand of course, how they there can were, be there reversed were a few, so many years ago. There were a few cases in the background with some dicta that suggested this would be some problems with this. And I know the court, you know, our court, our Supreme Court, has the obligation to render advisory opinions uh, to the uh, executive to the council and the legislature. 
and they hate doing it because there's no record developed, but they, they have to do it. So I don't know whether they just thought, you know, this is like, you know, actually another advisory opinion. But um, I, I feel very passionately about this, and this, as I say, is a, a bipartisan issue because you, whether you think that the voucher decision should have been able to be heard by the Supreme Court and decided, or you think the issue of members of our board and aldermen that voted on contracts that benefited their family members and ignored the well, city kind of, solicitor kind device. It's kind of funny. The, 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 the standard that they set is for, for standing, you have to be different from what happens to everybody else. And that's, that's kind of the flip side of the charter issue on direct benefit. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would think that direct benefit would be very similar to this idea that you, you have to have this individualized harm to, to yourself that's different from anybody else. Yeah. And and I think it would be the epitome of irony if, if, if that was used to, you know, to challenge these votes. I, I, I just do not see the argument that's been made against these aldermen. Um, that are voting on contracts. The, by, by the very nature of the fact that they're voting on a contract, it, there's an intermediary step between them and the family member. It's indirect. By definition, I, I just don't understand the no, you issue. Can, you can make that argument, but believe me, the Republicans are not convinced by that. I understand that they aren't. I, I, <laughs> and, but I think know, it's a, I, they're I, making I, a political I argument. I think they should be able to have their case in court, too. I think they should be able to have their case court, and you can make that argument. And others will say, no, the city charter is very clear. You should not vote on a, on an issue where you have a you or your immediate family members have an interest. I mean, I can see both. So you know, we'll see how it goes. It comes have a direct out. interest. See, you, you you put those three dots in there, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> what is direct? You know, I mean, it's. Uh, it's, it's and I can slope. see reason for greater clarity in our charter. You know, revisiting. Yeah. Well, I realize it's a cumbersome system. We failed so miserably in the last charter commission. It, it was absolutely and you tried. a disgrace. It was a disgrace. Yeah. Um, uh, we we really do need charter revision in the city of Manchester, and 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 we can't just nibble around the edges and keep everything yeah. the way it is. Yeah, it's a cumbersome yeah. process, and I know it involves personalities and philosophies, but I, I agree with you. Yeah. Revision is due. You know, we got we we've got the same people that keep getting elected to that charter commission that keep coming out and running. So mm -hmm. maybe in a few years it'll be a different crowd. Yeah. You know, we used to have a uh, annual ten year constitutional convention to consider amendments to our state constitution. We did away with that and I, I lament that too. We've, I think our federal constitution and our state constitution have been turned into objects not of governing law but of veneration and like religious things that we have to worship as perfection in the outset. And I don't agree with that at all. I think the founding fathers in Philadelphia wanted us to revisit that constitution and change it as time went on. And we've never done it since. And I think, you know, we had a mechanism in New Hampshire to do that, which resulted in some really good things. For example, we now, the legislature now meets annually. You and that was a result, years. I think, of the last constitutional convention where to, to everybody's surprise, I think, and I think it took a two thirds vote, the voters said, yes, we want the legislature to meet annually. We got a lot of things we need to do. And I think that was a very good decision. I would like to see that continue. So. Anyway, I'm getting kind of wound up here, and I'm kind of ignoring <laughs> That's our okay. esteemed I'm, guest. I'm I fine. wanted to go back a little bit to the issue of sanctuary cities. You're giving me a little pushback on that, uh, maybe both of you. But um, don't you think there's a lot of confusion that people think that sanctuary cities mean we're not going to go after undocumented workers here who commit crimes, which is not what it means. Okay. It just means that we are not going to act as uh, agents of the federal agents that are chasing undocumentedly. We're going to task our police, our law enforcement, with being part of that enforcement effort. And the argument against that is pretty clear and I think pretty compelling. When people are in danger, when people need help, we want them to free to call. Uh, the people who are there to protect them, our police, our fire, our sheriff, we want them to feel free to call. And if they think if they call, because of some dastardly, heinous crime that's being threatened or perpetuated that mean their own eviction and deportation in this country, they won't. And I think, uh, I think you know, I think we have a great chief of police here in Chief Willard. I think he agrees with me on this, and I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm ready for your comments. Well, I just don't think any, we are not meeting, having a meeting of the minds. 
you decide it's this, I decide it's this, and, and I think that's a really difficult process. Yeah, the, uh, the definition, there's no statutory definition right. of what a sanctuary city is, so it's very easy to trot that word out, and it means different things to different people. Yeah. So it's very hard to have I mean, a discussion uh, me, when you're I not think, agreeing on the definition. I, I think, the and uh, particularly from the responses of so many people of the candidates that were covered in these three questions in the union leader to our candidates, and a lot of people just think it means we're protecting criminals. Well, in a technical sense, people are here without document or criminals, but it's very technical. They may be here, they may be paying taxes, they may be working hard, they may be contributing to, the, you know, people that, are, people that come here as immigrants, and I say especially refugees, which are a different category, like Hassan Issa. What a contribution he's making to our city. What a dynamic young man. You know, all credit to him. Uh, you know, should he, 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 by the way, is an American citizen, yes. so this is not an issue for him. Uh, and, and, but there are and others refugees like refugees would, would not have anything to fear. But we, we have the, the situation down in Houston where ICE agents were at the, um, the, the shelters. Um, so what, what does that mean? You, you stay outside in a flood and a hurricane because you're afraid to go to the shelter? Yeah. What does that mean when you're, when you're a woman involved in domestic violence that you, you don't call the police? What, what's it mean? This, when, is, this is the you, thing. You know, this is the and thing. Chief Willard has been very solid on that. He, he's very solid. You do not have to fear the Manchester police. N never mind just when something's happening. The police have intelligence out there. The police, in order to, to maintain the law and order that we're trying to achieve here in Manchester, have to talk to people have to be able to get into the neighborhood and not have all the doors slammed in their face. These people have to be part of our community. Um, you know, they talk about issuing driver's licenses. Well, you know what? If they're driving without a license and they hit you and run off, you don't know who they are. But if at least they have Good a point. driver's Good license, you, th there's some uh, credibility. It's not a reward for, for bad deeds. It, 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 I, I think we have to have this dialogue. We have to have it on the national level because we're not going to solve it here in New Hampshire. But I do think that we can maintain our quality of life here in, in the city of Manchester and let the feds figure it out for themselves. We don't have to help them. Uh, wreak havoc on these communities that are part of our fiber. I, I I just think it was a very difficult question to put out there because of that inability yeah, to define it. You're a school board it. member. What well, kind of question is that for, for school I, board? To be honest, <laughs> as I said, I'll sit with you guys anytime and have a cup of coffee and we can talk about it and dialogue about yeah. it, but it has no relevance to whether you should vote for me as a school board member or not. So tell us what does have relevance as to why we should vote for you as a school board member. Well, um, I, I, I think my biggest bonus is my experience. Um, I was born here, raised here, public schools here, uh, taught here. I continue to, to, to reach out here. I was just recently reappointed to the New England Secondary Schools Consortium, which is a, an expert advisory board to um, all of the New England uh, departments of education. And so my, my tentacles are very, very deep. I try to be in the schools as much as I can. I try to be, and I don't micromanage. I, I and, you know, I'll call and say, is it a good day to stop in, or would you invite me if you have an event? So I think a lot of it has to do with my, my experience, the scope of my experience. Um, my passion is there, and I think any candidate running for school board I will probably have the same passion. But I, I do think that um, I've shown a track record particularly in my first term, more so than my second term. Our second term was a little bit unusual. Uh, we did not pass a, a great many things. We had many things tabled and have not fully accomplished them, and, and that to me is a little bit disheartening. I'm, I'm a real, I, I don't like to table anything. I like to deal with it. Yeah, you're an action person. Yeah, let's just it. do it. And if yeah. it's, even if the action is to return it or to refer to the administration or to refer back to another committee of the board, yeah. let's do something. Let's not just tie it up because it's very difficult to get something off the table once you put it there. Yep. We have items that have just sat there the better part of a year. Yep, that's the way it is. We have a curriculum management plan that has just been sitting there forever, and then people talk about concerns with the math curriculum, and that's that's been a big concern for some people. But we haven't put the management plan into, into place to take a closer look at the math curriculum. Yeah. So we've come to the end. It goes by fast every it year. It does. And uh, Connie, we're so glad you could come in and join us to talk about the election and about your your passion for what you do as an educator and uh, as a public official as well. And uh, it's been a really, uh, a really interesting hour. It's flown by as they always do. And uh, by gosh, we're going to be back next week with another one. How about that? I will not. I'm going on vacation, Bob. Oh, you're not here next I week? Will be, I will be away. Yep, I'm going to go oh. surfing in, in, in Hurricane Marie. <laughs>
Yeah, never uh, surfed in my life, but I hear the waves are going to be huge. Yeah, yeah. huge. <laughs> you may not need a board. Okay. Uh, well, great. Well, then I'll be back next week with another edition of the Progress Report. I don't know who will be my host. The week after that, Mike won't be here either because Lou D'Alessandro, my good friend, uh, Dean of the Senate, will be here for our first show in October. But um, we wish you, everybody out there, and thank you for our calls coming in. Appreciate it. And uh, we really appreciate uh, Connie joining us. And so we'll, we'll say goodbye and see you next week on the Progress Report. Take care, everybody.